Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host for today, John DeLynn. It's October 27th, 2022. And today we have uh, someone, really two people in studio that I've uh, that I have huge respect for and that I've wanted to interview for many, many years. The main guest for today is the one, the only, uh, Gary James Bergera. Hey, Gary. Hi, John. How Thanks for you? coming. Thank you. It's such a treat to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know who Gary is, if you're into Mormon history, Mormon studies, you'll know Gary because he uh, worked forever uh, for Signature Books and for the Smith Pettit Foundation. And I believe he still works for the Smith Pettit Foundation. But the reason why Gary and um, one of his colleagues, Ron Prittis, and so many other people, George Smith, have such a near and dear place in my heart is because when I was going through my faith crisis, kind of pre-Mormon internet, I think you could say, there are just several books that were instrumental. And I, I, I probably don't, I probably can't list all the books that were influential from, from signature books uh, that were influential to me, but certainly Grant Palmer's An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, certainly Losing a Lost Tribe, both of Michael Quinn's books, Origins of Power and Extensions of Power, um, and just so many other books have been just uh, and all of Dan Vogel's stuff, Dan Vogel's biography, uh, so many books on polygamy and Mormon history. It uh, We could do an entire episode listing all the contributions that um, Signature Books and the Smith Pettit Foundation have made to allow the sort of Mormon internet phenomenon of, of podcasts and blogs and social media and, and, and honestly just the awakening within Mormonism to accurate, factual, credible Mormon history and scholarship. So much of that uh, rests on the back of George Smith, the Smith Pettit Foundation, uh, Signature Books, and Gary Bergera and Ron Prittis and other people who have been involved. So, uh, Gary, you're a modest guy, so you probably don't even lo love that introduction, but that's my introduction and I'm sticking to it. It's, um, I'm not going to try to contradict it, so. <laughs> well, um, so before we actually, um, I'm going to have Gary introduce himself a little bit more, but what I want to do is just start with the middle and the ending. We are here to promote what I think is a really, really fascinating and important book. The book is called Justice and Mercy, Studies of Transgression in the Latter-day Saint Community, by Gary James Bergera and uh, with a contribution from Levina Fielding Anderson, who is also a legend, not just because she's one of the September 6th, um, not just because she called out ecclesiastical abuse decades decades ago and, and was excommunicated for that one offense, as I understand it, but she's also been a uh, part of the backbone of, of editing, providing editing services to Mormon scholarship for decades. Uh, is that fair to say? Yeah, that's very fair to say. Yeah. And she's been a good historian in her own right too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but this book, Justice and Mercy, there's a lot in it. And just to give you a quick preview, what it talks about is the disciplinary councils. And I, I think they were all excommunicated, right? Uh, no, not, not no, Joseph no. Smith of, of the, of the four people, uh, who, are, who feature in that book. Three of them were excommunicated, and one was, uh, it's hard to know what to call that. He was informally disfellowshipped. You're talking about Joseph F. Smith, the right? The patriarch, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about Albert Carrington, uh, Thomas Taylor, and Richard R. Lyman. Mm -hmm. And they were all, and Joseph F. Smith, and they were all um, leaders of significant status w within the Church of Jesus Christ. Three of, of them were States. general church officers, and Thomas Taylor uh, was Bishop? Bishop of the 14th Ward, a very important ward in Salt Lake, one of yeah. the original wards yeah. there. Yeah. And if you're wondering, those of you who are listening, who's that voice? <laughs> Does that voice sound familiar? I'm also just over the moon excited to have with us Brian Buchanan um, of, I guess you could say of signature, uh, of, um, sorry, of Benchmark Books fame, but also he's the co-host of the Mormon History Podcast with Lindsay Hanson Park. And I probably don't even know half of the contributions you've made within Mormon studies in, in the Mormon world, but that that's, that's about it right there. <laughs> well, and the other, the other key point is that Brian is the publisher 
of that book. Of this book. Yeah. And he helped with the editing as well. Uh, he helped immensely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so um, I want everyone right now to stop, stop, pause this interview, go to the description of this episode and click on the link and buy this book. And not, not for any other reason than that it's an excellent book and we want to support um, good scholarship and good writing. So please go buy this book. I promise you it's worth it. And what we're going to be doing today is to dig into at least these four stories. Um, and and uh, we've talked about Richard Lyman before on the Shannon Caldwell Montez episode because that – he he was an apostle who was excommunicated for an affair in the nineteenth in the twentieth century, so he's significant. He he was a third generation apostle, um, but but Albert, Albert Carrington. Uh, it, these are all just fascinating stories. So before we dive in, um, really quickly, Gary, would you give yourself a proper introduction just uh, to kind of include some of the things that I left out? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to, I'm more than happy to talk about myself. <laughs> so I am a two-time graduate of Brigham Young University. Uh, I grew up in Provo. I graduated from BYU in 1980 with a degree in psychology, and then again in 82 with a degree in public administration. Uh, from that, uh, Ron and I- Wait, were, what years? This, so I graduated in 1980, and then 1982. Okay, so you would have missed Ernest Wil Wilkinson. I, I missed Ernest Wilkinson. However, uh, when I was a, a student, an undergraduate at BYU, one of the classes that I took was in journalism, and I wanted to do an article on academic freedom at BYU, uh, which included the 1966-67 spiring. Wilkinson was still alive, so I actually made an appointment and I interviewed him on the record for the article that I was working on. So I at least met Ernest Wilkinson. So would you have been part of the Seventh East Press or would you have predated the Seventh East Press? So I was there at the beginnings of the Seventh East Press, yeah, in 1981. Whoa. So were you a part of the Seventh so East Press? I was a part of the Seventh East Press. Holy moly. So for those who don't know, before the Student Review, which a lot of you won't know about, when I was at BYU, Student Review was an underground, alternative, progressive, liberal newspaper that as a BYU student you could get pre-internet to find out all the cool scuttlebutt, like Paul Dunn or... Well, the Student you know, Review thought that the 70s Press or... was too liberal. <laughs> really? So, yeah. Yeah, but the 70s Press was the predecessor... It was. ...to the Student Review, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, wow, so you were causing trouble at BYU in the not, late 70s and no, early 80s. No, I was not causing trouble. What? I was teaching at the MTC at, at the same time that I was helping out with the 70th Press. Well, I want to just go into your story, but but I, <laughs> but I that that will take away from the book. Uh -huh. So I will stop under one condition. Can you guess what that condition is? Uh, the, the condition is that you're going to invite <laughs> me to come back and talk about some of these other things. Are you, and, are you, and I really appreciate that invitation. So you're thinking about it. I, I definitely will think about it. All right. All right. Okay. Well, I want to dig into your story, Gary and Ron and Levina and whoever else will come on and you, Brian, I would, I would love to interview you too, Brian, but anyway, anything else you want to say about your intro? I may have interrupted you. So from, from BYU, <laughs> uh, I worked with Ron on the history of BYU that was later published by signature. Uh, as we approached the end of that process, I was invited uh, both of us were invited to come on and work with Signature. So we started working at Signature from late 1984. Uh, I left Signature in 2001 to uh, work at the Smith Pettit Foundation. Ron stayed on at Signature until he retired a couple of years ago. Uh, I retired from uh, Signature Books in February of this year. Uh, from Signature Books? From Signature Books in February of this okay. year. I stayed on. Uh, I'm staying on part-time at Smith Pettit until the end of this year. And then I'll be done. I'll be fully retired and we'll be taking lots of naps probably or going to movies or who knows what, whatever retired people do. And tell people what Smith Pettit does. So Smith Pettit uh, is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. It identifies um, projects that it's interested in supporting and then it contracts with individuals to work on those projects as works for hire for the Smith Pettit Foundation. Uh, Invariably, the project, the finished projects, will then be submitted to Signature for possible publication. They still go through Signature's process. Uh, uh, it also partners with other nonprofits to support things that align with Smith Pettit's mission. Uh, so it funds some of the book awards and the writing awards that the Mormon History Association, the John Whitmer uh, Historical Association, the Utah State Historical Society, and other organizations 
uh, do. And and what are some of the projects that our my listenership and viewership would would have been most influenced by that would have come out of it would have come from the Smith Pettit Smith Pettit so, and so or so Smith yeah. Pettit sponsored the three biographies of Joseph Smith, two of which have have been published. The first one was by Richard uh, Van Wagner. The third one was by Marty Bradley Evans. The second one is by Dan Vogel, and it's at Signature right now and should be coming out next year. Uh, it also that's uh, the one about Kirtland. That's the one that covers the Ohio and the Missouri years. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because it covers Missouri too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it also sponsored Dan Vogel's critical edition of the history of the church. That six or seven volumes that came out a few years ago. Uh, it also uh, sponsored Dan Vogel's edition of the uh, definitive edition of the Wilford Woodruff Diaries that Benchmark published a couple of years ago. Okay. So those are probably the key. There's some other things too that that Smith Pettit's been involved with, but those are probably the, the the ones that most people are aware of. Beautiful. All right. And Brian, do you want to tell us anything about? I mean, uh, Mormon History Podcast is loved by by so many, just because you and Lindsay are doing great storytelling around history. Anything you want to say about you and Benchmark Books, uh, just as an introduction? It's my life has been so fun because I get to go to work every day and hang out with the people that I like, talk about the stuff that I like, and then I do a podcast about topics that I like with Lindsay, and it's it's so much fun. She's a very persuasive person. Yeah, uh, I actually am not much of a podcast person, and uh, as Year of Polygamy was had kind of was winding down somewhat, she approached me and said, "What if we just did a podcast about Mormon history and we just go beginning to end?" and I think if anyone else on earth would have asked, I would have said no, but she's very persuasive. So mm. we have a lot of fun doing it. It's as you know, maybe podcasting is kind of a lot of work, <laughs> but uh, it's very fun. And obviously uh, the world we're in podcasting is, is such an important way of telling all kinds of stories and particularly history. And, you know, there's a lot of people who may not want to sit down and read an 800 page book on a topic, but a good approachable podcast can get them, the 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 gist of the story and the important details and 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 it's it's a good part of our our history world. Love it. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue into today's episode because we're going to be telling the live telling the telling the tales of four disciplinary councils, three excommunications, and an ambiguous um, example of discipline of a of a church patriarch in um, in Joseph F. Smith, and it's a different Joseph F. Smith than many people uh, would be thinking of. So so before we actually jump in, Gary, in the beginning of, of this book, Justice and Mercy, you kind of try and set your intention. Mm -hmm. and, and what I perceived you trying to say is that you're not just trying to go for the scandal. You're not just trying to, to cover the controversy or, um, you know, people's peccadilloes. You, ha you have some very specific intentions in mind. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then also, Brian, I know you you probably had thoughts about why this book would be an important contribution as well. Well, for me, the primary motivation is to, uh, you know, the, these are th uh, four men, uh, important men in the history of the LDS Church. And, and the uh, stories of their uh, excommunications or their disciplining from the church are important factors, events in in their lives, in, in the lives of each of these men. And I think if you try to narrate the lives of these men without uh, treating these events, you misrepresent their lives. So that was my primary motive, was just to try to complete or, or at least to provide enough information for somebody who was later working on a full biography of each of these men uh, that would have access to and would be able to write a com their complete story and not something that was um, incomplete or that misrepresented. Uh, I'm also interested in in uh, transgression and what transgression means and what it represents in in a religious community and in this case specifically the LDS Church. So so those were the two main primary motivators for me uh, in tackling these uh, these men's stories. Yeah, they're also just fascinating. Brian, what would you add? If you, a few years back, when one of the seventy was disciplined, that was quite a big thing. That hadn't happened in a long time. And so, I think so that, you're talking about uh, uh, James Hamula. James Hamula, yeah. Hamula, yeah, okay, yeah. And and that was that was quite the, the big story, right? And and people were interested in in 
it's hard because Mormons walk this very interesting line of how they view their leaders. They we we pay lip service to the idea that they're of course they're normal people, but in practice that doesn't always work out. And so stories like this I think are important to remind everyone that that people are people even if they're leaders. And I do think it's also interesting for people to see that even though they were high level leaders in three of these cases, uh, their cases were not swept under the rug. They were investigated. They talked about it, and ultimately they did face discipline, just like an average person would have. And so I think that's that's an interesting point for people to consider is how the Mormon church court system works even at the highest levels, which is an important part of our history. If I'm thinking about disciplines I'm aware of, obviously Joseph Smith excommunicated people for breakfast, um, and probably Brigham Young did too. Uh, but the Oliver Cowdery example, it's like, oh, you accuse me of adultery, I'm going to excommunicate you. But but in my lifetime, there's George P. Lee, who is the Native American general authority, who probably apostatized, but he was excommunic he was excommunicated for sexual abuse of some kind, as I understand it. And then there's Paul H. Dunn, who was kind of put on emeritus status for, for not being honest. And then there's James Hamula. And you could kind of wonder whether Dieter Uchtdorf was disciplined a little bit and by being removed from the first presidency, just like uh, Hubie Brown would have been. But those are the ones that come to my mind. Um, but these four, I mean, I knew about Richard Lyman. Well, like what, an apostle has an, has an adulterous affair? So it's going to be fun to talk about that. But these others, I, I mean, I knew about Joseph F. Smith but so this is just going to be fun. All right, Brian. Anything else you want to say about? No, oh, these these are such fascinating stories, and yeah. that's this would probably be a good place to talk about kind of a little how the book came about. Yeah, is as Gary had published um, the the articles on Lyman and Carrington and Joseph F. Smith in the Journal of Mormon History, and they were fascinating articles that that created a lot of interest and people loved them. <clears throat> but um, in the world of books that I'm in, I know articles for a lot of people they won't necessarily see those. And so this this is really where the book began, is I thought these articles deserve to be part of a larger book that would get in more hands, because they are such fascinating stories that reveal so much of, of the Mormon character and our history, and, uh, and so it was, it was nice to see them get an, another life. Yeah, beautiful. Well, let's, uh, let's dive in, fellas. I'm so excited. So uh, the first, the first uh, chapter one of the book is about Albert... Carrington and I I'm sure I've stumbled on his name in my readings of Mormon history but man I didn't know the story so how do, how do we set up the life of Albert Carrington Gary? well he was um, he was one of the more educated members of the uh, LDS Church in the mid 19th mid to late 19th century uh, he rose in the ranks he became a counselor to Brigham Young uh, he was also an assistant uh, trustee and trust I think for a period of time and he, helped, he was one of the uh, administrators of Brigham Young's estate when Brigham Young died. He was called on uh, to preside over the church's British mission. And it was there that uh, uh, trouble started to happen. He, he became too close uh, with uh, some of the young women who worked in the mission office. Uh, people started to notice things. Reports started to filter back to Salt Lake. Um, he denied it. Really quick, was this before he was made an apostle? Or no, after? this was after. He's an okay. apostle at this time. So he's made an apostle, Is did you say so, around so 18, 1870, right? Yeah, so, and plural marriage is going on. He didn't have, he didn't bring his wife or wives with him uh, when he was president of the of the British mission. So he's a polygamist. He's a polygamist. And he's, a, he's an apostle. He's Remember an the apostle. Quorum of the Twelve, and he's serving as a mission president. He's serving as a mission president. And he's also maybe... You know, they're they're encouraged also to look for additional wives. And so it's possible that he was looking for additional wives and was in, taking things a little too in far. England. In, in England. England. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So what what <laughs> so 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 word is starting to come back. People are noticing things, people are talking. It's not good publicity. What are they noticing? They're noticing that he's they're noticing that he's spending too much time or inappropriate time or even more inappropriate kinds of physical physical contact with with one or more of the of the girls who are helping out in the in the mission office. Okay. Um, word gets back. Uh, he eventually Brian is he sent home? Is his mission over and he's sent home? He yeah he finishes his term and then John Henry Smith his colleague in the twelve comes to replace him as mission president and then he starts hearing those rumors also and starts to think there's probably 
fire where there's smoke and finds out there's and in the meantime, so <laughs> so Carrington is back home now. He is back home, and he is called to. Can I can I just note one thing? Uh -huh. Like we've been covering on Mormon stories. We did a six part episode on Joseph Smith's polygamy, and we we talk about some of the things that his polygamous wives have in common. And it it seems like if you're working close, if Joseph had people in the house, women in the house, domestic help, whatever you want to call it. Uh, orphans that were staying with him, they were kind of prey to his advances. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I, I don't know if it's a false equivalence or a false connection to say that Albert could have looked, if he had known about the life of Joseph Smith, he could have looked at Joseph Smith's life and said, hey, people who live in your house, that's that's how Joseph got a lot of his wife's. I'm, I'm, maybe we would never know whether he would have made that connection, but he certainly could have. Is that fair? It's fair. I... I I would be surprised if he actually was consciously making that connection. I think it was just a matter more of opportunity for him. Of all the people that are chronicled in, in that book, Carrington is the one personally for me that is hardest to sympathize with because his behavior seems more predatorial and abusive. Uh, so, it, it, uh, you know, I try to understand where he's coming from, but when I step back, from that, it it he is maybe the least sympathetic because of the power differential. Because he's because an of the apostle, power differential, yeah, and 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 these just women the were way that he's yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Lyman is easier because it was just a, a you know a, a it yeah. was a long term relationship. Yeah, and there seems to have been genuine love between the two of them. I'm not sure how much Albert Carrington loved the women that he was involved with. Okay, okay. All right, so the so the mission president follows him, says, "Hey, there might be an issue." Does he raise a red flag? Does he? He does raise red flags. Um, there are meetings. Carrington denies it. We, uh, meetings with the uh, with the first presidency, the with the first of the presidency, 12, in the right? twelve. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Carrington it, does deny it. He's he's categorical, isn't he, Brian, about denying it at that point? He'll he'll admit sometimes early on to maybe a little foolishness, mm -hmm. and his language uh, when he talks about it is fascinating because. He clearly sees what's going on very, very differently than all of his colleagues do, especially as it starts to get worse and more details come out. Well, the details that come out is that some of the women immigrate to Salt Lake, right? And, and they get married, and, um, and, and apparently they talk about it. And, and their husband, at least in one case, the husband, right, was the one who complained. And they started, the, the church authorities started to take these much more seriously they realized that Carrington had not been honest with them. Yeah, you, I think I get the impression that one of these women, we should probably have get her name. I've got, is it Kirkham? Sarah Kirkman. Yeah. Kirkman, yeah. So so I guess she gets married, and then the husband, I guess she confesses, and the husband finds out that she had had some type of sexual relations with this apostle. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I just wanted to note one thing. There's kind of almost this conflict of interest if the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve are investigating one of their own mm -hmm. because clearly they would have an interest in there not being a scandal. Mm -hmm. So when it's brought up the first time or two with, with, uh, Carrington, Carrington, mm -hmm. um, that he's like, I didn't do it. And they're like, okay, you're, you're fine. Yeah. And they just let him go. And it just makes you wonder how it's almost like a boys club vibe where like, Oh, sure. You wouldn't do it. These people, they're nuisances. Uh, they're, these are not the droids you're looking for. Let's move on. Is that is that fair to say? They would, um, sure. I mean, I I think that there probably was some of that, but for me, when I look at it, I think more that they they had had a long experience with Carrington. They they knew what he was like, and I think that there's an inclination uh, to view him as a colleague, maybe even a friend, and to believe him when he denies that, and that which makes. The, the sense of betrayal that much greater when when they are confronted with these things and Carrington does come clean. Uh, and I think that that may have been as much a factor in their decision not only to excommunicate him, but to uh, not allow him readmission or, um, or to postpone uh, restoring any priesthood or temple right. blessings that he may have received. So, yeah, I think there's some of that that, you know, we want to keep this quiet, but... Care, but the idea that, that this man, this friend lied to us, 
uh, I think maybe was even a bigger factor in in how they cho- how they continued. When when Kirkman brings his wife to uh, mm-hmm. to kind of tell on on Carrington, it's not just that she had had sexual relations with Carrington before she married him. It's that those sex that sexual relationship had continued, mm-hmm. as if Carrington had kind of groomed this couple yeah. with his influence, yeah. so that he could have continued access mm-hmm. to to Mrs. Kirkman mm-hmm. after she had been married. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's extra troubling. Okay, keep going. Yeah, it is. Um, so 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 they find out, and 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 they call him in, and and he eventually does come clean. He offers certain explanations or, uh, he, he minimizes his, his, uh, adultery. <laughs> uh, one of the big things is, is the way that he sees adultery. Um, uh, he says that the, he used protection of some kind. And so the seed didn't mix and, and that for him seems to be, uh, <laughs> some kind of reason why it isn't, it wasn't as bad as the rest of you want to make this out. Can I read, can I read from your book? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. So this is from, uh, this is from justice and mercy, uh, page 10. It says, quote, it seems that brother Carrington told her in the beginning of their connection that there was no harm if they did not mix their seeds. She worded it also in another way that he told her there was no harm if they didn't go through the whole performance. Mm-hmm. Now this obviously calls to me the, you know, this idea of soaking just all, all this, all this sort of weird BYU non-sex sex that happens these days. These ideas are not new. <laughs> they're not new. Yeah, they're not new, yeah. but, but the, the chapter is called a little folly in Israel. And I think that's what you're kind of say. Like, yeah. and I think he even gets that term from Brigham Young. No, he gets, he, I mean, maybe, but he, he uses it, it on Brigham Young. He uses it. Yeah, he does say, yeah. yeah. George he, Buchanan's not happy about that. No. <laughs> yeah. So he basically says, if the seed doesn't mix, it's, it's not it's, adultery. It's, it's not, it's not adultery. definition adultery. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. All right. So yeah. and they know they don't. You know, it doesn't work. Okay. His his, his rationale is not accepted, and it it makes things worse. Okay. So they do come down hard on him. They excommunicate him. They publish a notice. They explain the reasons why uh, that it is for. I think did they even use the term adultery in the notice of excommunication, Brian? I think they do, and at other times they call it lewd and lascivious, lascivious. conduct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They. That's the thing is, once they the, his colleagues understand the full extent of this, they are horrified, and their journals are very, very detailed about this, and. They, you know, they say this is the most disgusting recital I've ever heard. And so really when they do understand what's going on, they, they are willing to, to face it and own up to it. But what I also think is an important point is to remember that this is all going on in the 1880s yeah. when the, the anti-polygamy legislation is coming down on their heads. And so there is this, this kind of siege mentality that they've set into. And so I think that also helps to explain why at the beginning they're maybe not quite as as willing to accept it is because they're constantly facing this, what they see as as persecution from the outside. And so this is just yet another example of this until all the details come out and they realize, oh no, this is real. This is, and we believe this and we're horrified. Yeah. Well, they also, it, it does serve as a kind of a PR move too, to be able to say, look, we're publishing, um, we're, we're, we're practicing plural marriage, but it's a moral practice. So Carrington comes along and it just, you know, it feeds all of the, the, the um, critical tropes regarding polygamy. And so they move quickly and decisively to say, this is not polygamy. This is not us. Well, that's what, you know, one of the names I recognize is Moses Thatcher. I know that he was a polygamist himself mm-hmm. and an apostle. Mm-hmm. And isn't he one of the ones who's excommunicated for for continuing with post manifesto polygamy? He's he was, not. He was not. He's not. He's he's disciplined. He got ex- he got excommunicated though, right? I, I do you know Brian? Was it officially excommunicated? He, he's dropped he from the just, quorum. Dropped yeah. for the quorum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For that what? Was for political stuff. It was he would not oh. align politically with the the okay, church. Okay. And, and, okay. And 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 just resented the political manifesto and. and yeah, he wouldn't do that. He also had some substance abuse issues. You know, he was treated for pain. Oh, and developed a, opiates. A, yeah. Okay. And, and, yeah. 
Well, I, I just think it's, this is always, and this happens with the Lyman thing too. And it happened with John C. Bennett. It's like, okay, what's the difference between, like, it's, it seems like lines get blurred. As soon as it's no longer monogamy, as soon as there's polygamy and plural marriage, then lines get blurred. And so it's weird that Moses Thatcher has a ton of wives and, and I, I guess Carrington's on the hunt. He has multiple wives, but somehow Moses Thatcher has a moral high ground and the other apostles because they're somehow their additional sexual partners are approved of, but this one with with Carrington wasn't because he got caught. Brian, you're nodding your head. Why, why were you nodding your head? This, I think, is such a fascinating thing, and this is an aspect of polygamy that doesn't get talked about enough, is if you are the one of the wives of a man that's involved in behavior like this, what is the difference between courting a potential plural wife or run-of-the-mill, what other people would see as an affair. Or not even the wives in England when this is going on. The other church members that are seeing this, what's the difference? I have an ancestor who served uh, a mission later in life to England where he was born and brought home a plural wife who was my ancestor. And so this, yeah, like you said, the, the, the criteria of what is acceptable, not acceptable behavior during polygamy is very, very messy. And... Well, Always was. Well, this is one of the, the key points in, in talking about transgression. You know, what is it? What are, what are you transgressing? Yeah. Yeah, it's and, easy and for the decides? lines to get blurred. Yeah. Who decides what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's also worth noting that one of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve was Brigham Young Jr., who had married one of Carrington's daughters. Yeah. So there's another conflict of interest in the Quorum, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so... So, so he is. So Carrington is at this point when he's excommunicated. Brian, how old is, is he? Is he in his eighties? He is. Yeah, he's and that's so, and, and his health isn't very good, uh, and so he's basically shunned now. He's excommunicated. He's shunned. His family's embarrassed. It's just. I, I even think the marriage between his daughter and Brigham Young Jr. that founders, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, it. It's uh, Carrington's life just goes downhill from there, and his health is bad. Uh, he has people both within the family and without who who then start to uh, urge his rebaptism. Uh, the, the brethren are not interested in rebaptizing him. Finally, his health becomes so precarious that they see it as a blessing to him to rebaptize him which they do, right, while he's still alive, although I think they do it privately in his Wasn't home. Wasn't it in his bathtub? Yeah, they, they do it in his home, okay. in his own Can tub. I address that really quick? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I was on my mission, there was a former branch president who had embezzled some tithing uh, and, and had been disciplined. And I, I, I had to be a part of the disciplinary council as a young missionary in Guatemala. So I'm reading the Church Handbook of Instructions, probably in Spanish, and it's and I'm like, well, how do you decide if it's let go, disfellowshipped, or excommunication? Literally, one of the criteria was how public, mm -hmm. how known is the scandal, right, or or the offense? Mm -hmm. And in my mind at the time, I'm like, well, does God care? Like, why would God care how public the scandal is? It should be sin or no sin, and the the crime should be the punishment should be equally distributed, whether it's mm -hmm. well known or not. You know, if I'm thinking about the origins of that policy, I'm thinking about Carrington and Lyman and others, because I, it's got to be that there's been apostles who have, have made major mistakes or major discretions, but nobody knew. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like if nobody knows, then maybe no harm, no foul, mm -hmm. right? Is that, but, but in this case, they're really anguished about kicking him out. Mm -hmm. Because if they do, it's going to be all over the papers, and then all the enemies of the church, like the Salt Lake Tribune, mm -hmm. are going to be all over it. Mm -hmm. Is that is that worth kind of exploring just a tiny bit? Just this idea of like not them not wanting a PR scandal. Well, this goes back to what you said before, right? That <clears throat> that um, uh, that there's a disinclination to want to publicize uh, what what they worry is going to be seen as as dirty laundry and is going to give ammunition to their enemies. Um, yeah, I think that that's part of it. Although I can remember uh, as a youth in the 1960s that they would announce excommunications to the ward. 
Uh, but that's of, of leaders or just of, that was of, of regular just a, members? No, that was just, yeah, that was regular <laughs> members. Um, I, I think that being a general uh, officer of the church in their eyes is different. And if there is a serious malfeasance, a serious transaction, uh, that they make a point of that because it does, it can be used to reinforce uh, boundary maintenance. And, and I think they're telling people, look, this is, we, can, we can tolerate a certain amount of disobedience or of transgression, but at a certain point, we can't. And we want you, we want everybody to know about this, that, that up to this point, maybe we can deal with it, but after this point, sorry, no. Uh, and and with Carrington, the the whole thing about him being baptized at home in his bathtub, I think part of that was they didn't want to make a public exactly. statement. But I also think they were worried about his health. Sure. And and he probably was infirm enough that they could not bring him to a to a traditional font. Uh, but they were still even after that point, they were still you know that, getting rebaptized is one thing. Having your priesthood and temple blessings restored is something else. That's right. And they kept and and. You know, you can see them continuing. It, it's almost uh, forgiveness. There, there are various levels of forgiveness, right? So, and I think baptism is one level of forgiveness. Rebaptism is one level of forgiveness. Priesthood restoration for men and temple blessings is is another. And they finally decided Carrington's health was was he was in decline. He was dying. And I think that they finally decided, let's see if we can do something. Let, let's restore his priesthood and his temple blessings. Uh, but I think he died, didn't he, just before? As they were on their way to his house to do something, I think he passed away. And and they weren't able to do that. And it was done. Did they do it? They must have done it then posthumously. You can, you can do right? it after. Yeah. 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 Well, that's fascinating. Well, maybe the ba- the bathtub baptism just fascinated me. It's interesting, isn't it? But I did. It, for me, I felt like it was to avoid scandal. But but uh, that is fair. His health was in decline. I I, I think there may have been as maybe much two that. birds with one stone. I, I don't. I think that it's <laughs> possibly. Yeah. I mean, I think they could have done it in a font if he had been able to, and still tried to keep it, you know, quiet. Yeah. Um, but I suspect that, that, that they maybe had to lift him, lower him into the tub, and it was just. Well, this theme, this theme repeats, uh, through, through many of these stories, mm-hmm. just once they're kicked out, they really want back in sometimes almost immediately. Yeah. And so part of what's fascinating, uh, about this book, justice and mercy is that you include the journal accounts of many of these apostles mm-hmm. where they're torn and deliberating. Mm-hmm. Do we get him rebaptized or not? What will the public think? Has he shown enough contrition yet? We'll get to that with Lyman. Mm-hmm. And, and then, and then like you said, the baptism may or may not happen, but then it's like, do we restore all the blessings? Yes or no. Yeah. Or does it get done in the afterlife? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's well, a, I, that's a great part of the book is to hear, to read the, the diary journals yeah. of, of the apostles sometimes well, tormented I, over these questions. Lyman is, is interesting. And, and, and I'm happy to talk about we'll get Lyman there. Yeah, right we'll now get there. too, if you, if you want to do well, that. Let, you, well, anything else about Carrington, or, Brian? Do you want to? No, I, I think that's, that's probably good on him. Okay, let's. If it's okay, let's go in order, just because okay. um, that's how it, that's how I read it in my brain. So the second uh, mm-hmm. gentleman, he was not an apostle, no. but he was a prominent bishop in Salt Lake. Mm-hmm. But he did a lot of work down in southern Utah, specifically around Cedar City, mm-hmm. and his name was Thomas Taylor. So let's tell the story of Thomas Taylor. <laughs> so Thomas Taylor, Brian, you're going to have to help me with this because my memory is not so good. Uh, Thomas Taylor was, he was the bishop, but he also had business interests, and he was uh, the church's uh, immigration agent, is that right? Uh, and he funded a lot of the stuff himself. He was hoping that he would get reimbursed uh, for helping to bring however many thousands of people he, he helped coordinate their, their immigration to Utah. Um, and what was it that happened in southern Utah? And why was he down there? Well, and, and this is so fascinating because people today, a bishop— is a very different sort of animal than they were in the 19th century. You know, they, they had so many different things, and they're trying to provide for usually multiple families. And so, yeah, he's down there promoting iron interests and, and trying to get some business things going. Mining, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and all of a sudden, yes, rumors start flying about him also. Well, he spends a lot of time on these interests. He's, he's not in town, right? He's out in the country, and he's got some people to help him out there. 
And and that's so fascinating too because then it creates this jurisdictional conflict. It's, well, can we talk about the offense really quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to talk about it or do you want to talk about it? Well, he, it, it's he, a little there bit. There were some young men, right, that who who had been helping him out there, and and they. What was it? Why did they? What was it that elicited? They they he. Um, There's uh, a pattern. He he. he what did he want them to do? He wanted them to. So basically, him. so basically, he, wanted, he would he would get these. Uh, tell me if I got this right. He would he would get young men mm -hmm. to help him with whatever mining efforts he was trying, and he would end up sleeping in the. And this is the bishop, mind you. It's it's kind of a molesting bishop. Mm -hmm. He would get these young men to get in a bed with him to sleep the night because he's on business ventures, which was very common in the nineteenth century. That's another thing I think modern readers would be would find odd, but. That was by no means unusual. Yeah, to share a bed, I guess. But but he's but he's got this pattern of of grooming these young men to share a bed with him. He hires them, they come on jobs with him, and then while he's in bed with these young men, he would grab their hand, uh, put them on his um, genitalia, and and encourage the the men to make him um, ejaculate. Sorry, it's gross, but that's that's what he did. And there's there's at least three instances. Where where young men testified that this molesting bishop, mm -hmm. um, Thomas Taylor, mm -hmm. would would perform these acts. Now we don't know what other things he did, but these are just three instances where these men were willing to go to church leaders and say, yeah. "This bishop, and this it was, Mormon it was, bishop." It was all the same offense, yeah. right? With them, it yep. was all kind of a. And was it mutual masturbation, or was it just nope. them them masturbating? There, him? There's a question in the book whether he even necessarily was gay. Because yeah. it was just like I need to take care of my business, and you're going to help yeah. me it seems, with your hand. It does seem more situational, yeah, than it does anything else, right? Yeah. There are just... some hints. He says before he was baptized, he engaged in something. He doesn't really elaborate. So, and and you can kind of see him trying to fight it. He he makes references to how he knew it was wrong, but yeah, like you said, situational. It came up and kept happening. So this is this comes up. So this surfaces down in Cedar City, right? And the most that the Cedar City people do, that leaders do, is to do what? They don't feel like they can, they can uh, do anything in terms of his membership because he's not a member of their of their ward or stake. Um, how does it get referred up to Salt Lake then? Yeah, they say, well, this isn't this isn't our jurisdiction. They kick it yeah. back up to Salt Lake, and they say, well, we can release him as bishop, but beyond that. The, the transgressions didn't happen here, so that's your job, Cedar City. So they keep kicking it back and forth, which is a very interesting... And, and so finally, it ends up with whom? Finally, um, I, I, they almost... They just kind of let it go for the most part, and Salt Lake takes their action, and and it is also interesting because then you have these lingering business conflicts. Okay, wait, can I just say... Them. Can I just say what I remember reading it? Uh -huh. Just because I read this... Like yesterday, um, so apparently, somehow the Sully Tribune, yeah, yeah, that's God right. bless yeah. the yep. Sully Tribune, yeah. finds out that this guy's got some accusations because his name is omitted, right? So from... when the Deseret News publishes a, a list of the current bishops in Salt Lake City or Salt Lake County, they don't they leave off the yeah, name yeah. of Taylor, but they don't explain why. Yeah. Eagle Eye Tribune notices. <laughs> so the trip is like, hey. Hey everyone, the church just left off the name of Thomas Taylor as one of the bishops in Salt Lake. You you ought to you ought to start asking questions about why. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and then the Deseret News publishes <laughs> a notice of excommunication mm -hmm. in error. And Taylor <laughs> reads this and thinks, wait, did I get excommunicated? And he writes a letter. And yeah, it's a very, very confusing story for all parties. Yeah. What, what's the upshot of the letter? It's that that he's he says I I'm sorry for what I did and uh, he also kind of hints at the business conflicts that's there between him and general authorities and so this was this was an interesting one because unlike the others where it was almost a purely sexual nature you also get some kind of lingering business uh, resentment that's that's there which is a, well is he complaining about that or is he threatening to expose uh, business malfeasance. It's a mixture of everything. He, he he kind of confesses in one paragraph and then kind of wonders, where am I left? And mm -hmm. it's and can, not really resolved is, to their is, satisfaction. He is excommunicated. 
eventually, right? yeah. but not by that point when it's published is the right. weird part. Right. So, and it's also, I mean, I'm thinking about the Boy Scout scandal today. I'm thinking about. It seems like every month along the Wasatch Front, there's a bishop accused of, of abuse or molestation, a Mormon bishop accused of that, or, or across the United States. Like this idea of priesthood leaders having a, a broad pattern of abuse, not a 80%, but you know, certainly some percentage of Mormon ecclesiastical leaders just, and CES instructors continue to abuse using their position of power. And, you know, so... But but it seemed like the church wanted to keep this out of the courts, and so it because right now there's this whole uh, West Virginia and Arizona cases where where the church is using Curtin McConkie to do their best to keep any of these abuse allegations out of the court system. I'm obviously looking for the root history that that might lead to the church help lead to the church's practices today when it comes to scandal and potential legal allegation. So I just had to make that tie mm. that they tried to keep this out of the courts. Mm -hmm. it, you know, even if they did um pursue it in church court only uh, after they were caught right. with their hand in the cookie jar. Right. Do you mind if I read just a little bit sure, from the book? Ahead. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is this is Thomas Taylor after he's caught, and I guess this comes out of his journal, um, but it says, I have sinned and done grievously wrong. I'm cut off from the church that I know is of God, and I have brought it upon myself, and oh, how wretched I am. I have blamed men whom I have thought acted spitefully towards me in other things, but I desire to be submissive and acknowledge that it is just, and now I plead for mercy. Oh, do not cast me off forever. I want to have the privilege of the visits of the teachers. Now, that was interesting. Oh, I'm going to keep reading, and then I'm going to come back to that. I want to show them. That I, is it talking about home teachers or teachers in the ward? Like, who are the teachers that he's talking about? I'll finish reading, and then I want to hear Brian so or, or Gary. Um, I want to have the privilege of the visits of the teachers. I want to show them, if my Heavenly Father will help me, how I will repent of my sins. I want to be humble and do right that I may yet be saved through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want my wife and um, children who are here to be visited by the teachers. Uh, they have done no wrong. When overwhelmed with grief, my wife has cheered and comforted me and said, can't you do right from this time on and be forgiven? I said, I will try. My family in the city have had um, jobs, comforters and my wife Elizabeth Romney wants a divorce and my family will be broken up. So basically he's married to multiple women. Somehow that's not enough for him. And he's married to a Romney. So Elizabeth Romney is one of his wives and I think she ends up divorcing him. But do you have an idea who these teachers are that he really wanted to make sure still came around? I assumed it was the ward teachers. Like home teachers? Yeah. But it was this the calling of deacon teacher priest that was different than the these way were are? adults, right? And they would be, but 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 the whole teachers or fourteen year olds, that's a relatively modern thing, right? Yeah. Okay. And they, and they would have hewed a little closer to the the idea of the doctrine and covenants to the, the teachers specifically. See, there's no evil in the church, so especially like during the Reformation, they had more of a catechizing purpose of asking more pointed questions about morality and things like that. So it would have been, you know, less of just presenting a message like in current times, but more. Uh, proactive helping out yeah seeing yeah. that the morality of the church is strong kind of thing there was one other little paragraph that i thought was really interesting he writes i'm sending my consent today for my wife and this is the this is elizabeth romney for my wife to obtain a divorce she never had appreciated the addition of wives to my family this is the first wife um elizabeth romney and now i have sinned her patience is exhausted and I fear for my children. So it's again, she never liked the polygamy, but she went along with it. Mm -hmm. I just always love to call that out because mm -hmm. the church makes it sound like almost every woman who was engaged in polygamy loved it and had a testimony of it. Mm -hmm. But Elizabeth Romney never liked it. Yeah. All right. What else do we want to say about the molesting bishop, Thomas Taylor? Uh, was he rebaptized? That's a good question. I do not remember. Yeah. So I want to say he was. Um, it seemed like he it. was rebaptized four years later. Okay, yeah. So he did get rebaptized, and it was four years later. 
which was much less time than it took Richard Lyman, who's our next subject. Or so it's four for, years, or, yeah. four years of a delay yeah. for sexually molesting three boys. Yeah. Wait four years, yeah. and you get rebaptized. Yeah. You know, if you have privilege, I guess I don't know. I don't uh, know if it would be better it's or worse. Depend on what you did. Yeah. 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 Also, he seemed to be much more penitent than the others. Carrington, you know, he didn't try to deny, I don't think, as much as some of the others did. And uh, they really didn't like it if you talked back. Yeah. And he didn't do that as much. The problem with that is, is what we know about child molesters is that they don't, they, they, they often don't, they don't change. They, they can't be rehabilitated. Yeah. So I just want to call it to the fact that if they're like, oh, four years, he was penitent, let's bring him back. That doesn't mean he's changed his behavior. Yeah. And that could restore. And he goes on to still have some influence in the community and his business deals. Mm -hmm. So it it still puts children in danger when the church mm -hmm. rebaptizes pedophiles. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I and today, if this had happened, I don't know if the response would have been the same. You know, if they yeah. would have, you know, if four years was, you know. Yeah. If 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 if, if that if they would have wanted him to, you know, wait longer. I don't know how that works. Do you know? What, what with so somebody does let's say some today somebody does this kind of behavior is excommunicated do, do they have like a limit you can't come back for x number of years oh i have or, no idea yeah. i think it's it's all about who you know and and who you're connected okay. to and probably how prevalent it is and, and there's probably some type of legal assessment with kurt and mcconkey to decide okay. what the risks are but historically in the past 20 30 years a child molester might not even be excommunicated. Right. And then if, and only if they got caught and yeah, rebaptism is yeah. always yeah. a possibility. Yeah. All right. Well, that takes care of the molesting Bishop Thomas Taylor. It's time to switch to one that I was familiar with, but yeah. it was still fun to read about it. Yeah. Richard R. Lyman, the, the three generation apostle yeah. who had an adulterous affair as an apostle. Yeah. For, for me, so so Richard Lyman is, uh, again, he, he was a highly educated uh, member of the church and, and was one of the first uh, PhDs to be called as an apostle. Uh, and he had a long time, his, his family goes back forever in the church. For me, the thing that struck, that struck me about this is that he was... He, he got a PhD he, from Cornell. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and he was in the engineering department at the University of Utah, I think. That's right. Uh, I think he had something to, 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 to do with the naming of the streets and, or the laying out of the, the streets in Salt Lake City. Um, the, 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 the problem, the, the, his problem started when he was asked to help bring back into the church a woman who had been excommunicated for being a plural wife, a post-manifesto plural wife. Is it okay if we mention his wife, Amy, Amy Brown Lyman, mm -hmm. just to set some context? Yeah. What, what, and what, she was also a church officer. She was president of the Relief Society. Yeah, he's married for, to Amy Brown Lyman, time. and she was like president of the Relief Society, yeah. like a, yeah. a prominent, yeah. educated, smart, yeah. capable woman. Mm -hmm. There was a problem, though. Yeah. Do you want to talk yeah. about just their marital problem? Well, so, it might have been a precursor to some of this. Uh, are we talking about the son or just that the came fact later? That, that but you get the that sense their temperaments that were different, and well, and and they, you know, they, they they their relationship seems to have turned platonic at a certain point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That like after after their final kid, she just said, you're, "We're done having, we're basically yeah. done having sex." Yeah. So this is a man married to one woman, mm -hmm. and they're not having sex, but he's an apostle. Mm -hmm. I think that's an that's an important context to build. Also, did the death of his son predate his relationship with? Uh, I don't know that it pre did it predate it. He started working with her before. Yeah. Then the the son dies, and then but then their 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 relationship then begins after. That yeah. that was something I didn't realize is that the sons they have a son. Mm -hmm. The son's wife dies likely by suicide. Is that right? I or, can't remember if it was this was the wife or was it wasn't. him. Okay. It was his that it was him that looks some like question. it looks like suicide. So their their daughter in law dies, mm -hmm. and then a year or two after that, they're putting pressure on him. He has an alcohol problem. Yeah, he's not making good on the family name. Right. Lyman's traveling all over the world. He probably can't be the dad that he needs to be. Right. And then his son dies by asphyxiation of carbon monoxide poisoning. That's right. In the garage, I didn't realize that. So yeah. so deep tragedy. I think it's his only son. Yeah. 
right? Yep. And so he's, he's in a loveless marriage, at least in terms of sexual intimacy, and they have a, a son die by yeah. suicide yeah. as an apostle. Yeah. Okay. And as Sorry. this is going on, yeah. uh, he is tasked with helping to bring back into membership a woman who was excommunicated for being a, a post-manifesto plural wife. And can we, can we just talk about the history of that really quickly? Sure. So she's from, what, Scandinavia, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And some Mormon guy kind of grooms her into being a plural wife. Right. After after the manifesto. After the manifesto. After the second manifesto. After even. the second manifesto. Yeah, Quinn estimates it was probably 1909 that the marriage occurred. What, and what's her name? Her name is Anna Jacobson. Anna Jacobson. Yeah. So she's groomed by a Mormon, becomes a post -manif second post-manifesto plural wife, mm -hmm. but then... Get She's it. excommunicated. But he wasn't. But he wasn't. He was just... He, he left and went someplace else. Yeah, he Yeah, so the church to... lets off the the offending polygamous yeah. male. I will and then say that one was the... that was unusual for that to happen in those cases. Um if anyone was not going to be excommunicated it would usually be the wife. So that that what that did I that caught my attention too that 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 was not the usual pattern. Yeah. Yeah, like that, I, I wonder, you know, because it's so weird that then he gets assigned to bring her back into the church. Like, why is the church, of all the important things an apostle has to do, mm -hmm. why is the church assigning an apostle to fellowship an excommunicated plural wife? Yeah. Isn't that weird? Was that, did you find that weird? So that didn't, I, I can, I, I see what you're saying. When I read this stuff and was looking at it for the first time, that didn't strike me as unusual. But I also, I don't, I don't think I was looking for, I, I, I don't think I had the context to know if that was going to be unusual. If, if they, because I don't know, maybe they've had other, do you know, Brian? Did there, they? there were cases um, for a few years, Talmadge was sort of the point man in the Quorum of the Twelve to deal with post Second Manifesto cases. And there was one, actually, he, he helped, very similar thing. He was asked to help bring this woman back into fellowship. And she, that caught my attention because she had later married my great great grandfather and so there i think there were cases like this and and part of that just goes to the messiness of of post manifesto and particularly post second manifesto polygamy and in a lot of cases i think there there was the inclination to excommunicate but later decide that may have been too harsh conditions were kind of messy and so I, there were cases like this where they were tasked specifically of of working with individuals Hmm. But that just seems like, again, bad decision-making. Seems like they should have a woman fellowshipping Anna Jacobson back into the church, but here, here they've almost given permission for Richard Lyman to be spending a lot of time with a, with a divorced woman who's single, mm -hmm. and he starts fellowshipping her over multiple years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that just makes no sense, but I mean, I don't know. Well, I don't think they anticipated <laughs> what was going to happen. Um, so what does happen? But, but so so they they uh, they become friends. The 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 friendship uh, at some point, and and Lyman refers to this later. He says that at some point, uh, uh, they they developed a very strong friendship. They even decided that uh, when one of them died, they would arrange to have the other one sealed as a plural wife to Lyman. Um, but they continue to interact, um, and and eventually, as Lyman explains, there uh, there there came a point where he um, succumbed to temptation, and their relationship turned sexual. And and my understanding was he was in a at least for like ten or fifteen years of the time he was an active apostle, he was also in this in, yeah, in this right. sexual affair. Yeah, he would he would, apparently what would happen is that is that there were, there were times. When the twelve would have their weekly meeting in the temple on Thursday, and then he would walk up Main Street to Center Street to her apartment and spend time with her after the temple meeting. I mean, we're always pounding hard on the folly of this this notion that church leaders have discernment, that they have the ability to kind of get get promptings from the Holy Ghost when bad things are going on. If ever there was a case of a lack of discernment, it's the fact that the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve were had a had an adulterer among them for what twelve fifteen years probably and yeah, and they like and they had no idea yeah yeah at some point though somebody notices something right and reports start reaching J. Reuben Clark that you know uh, um, 
Elder Lyman has been observed, you know, going into this apartment. And so uh, the church and and Clark especially, they've been using members of the Salt Lake Police Department to investigate polygamists, right? And, and you, you know... You, you know the 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 name Vetterly. Yeah. You probably know why that name means something to me, right? Because because uh, I was a political science student at BYU, yeah. and there was a Vetterly professor there who's probably the son of this Vetterly on the police force, who ended up being one of the professors that supported, as I understand it, supported Wilkinson in kind of that spiring stuff that happened in the '60s and '70s. Dick Th- Vetterly. That actually v- v- the Vetterly that you're talking about came in later. To the, he yeah, was, yeah, yeah. He was hired under Dallin Oaks, right? But I'm just saying that's where Dallin the names. That's yeah, where yeah. The, the, the name. I'm not sure. I think I might have looked into that, and I don't know that there was like it was a lineal dad, relationship. You're not sure if it was his it dad. It may have been something else because it's too coincidental, right? So who was this not Vetterly? Be, Who's this Vetterly in your book? It wasn't he the uh, police chief? He's the police chief of yeah. Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. So, so they uh, the twelve decides they need to. They've heard these stories. They, they now need proof. And, and what they decided is they need like visual proof <laughs> of this. So uh, J. Ruben Clark asks Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold B. Lee to accompany the police up to this house. And they apparently break down the doors. They catch them in some doing something that is that provides enough proof so that they subsequently bring charges of adultery. Uh, uh, against Richard Lyman and excommunicate him. And a little while later, they excommunicate uh, Anna Jacobson. Yeah, so for me, this idea, and I guess it was some of the people involved were J. Reuben Clark, Harold B. Lee, and Joseph Fielding Smith. Right. All people that kind of were rougher, right? I I think had a reputation of being kind of rough guys in some ways. Maybe um, moralistic, I don't know what the right... Moral hardliners, definitely. Yeah, so they get these moral hardliners guys. What a what a weird relationship that Mormon church apostles are partnering with the police force. Mm-hmm. Not, I mean, was it was adultery technically illegal? I, I assume it would have been. You know, if you really, if it if it came to that, <laughs> but 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 whether it was illegal or not, like civilly illegal, yeah, this was just something that they. I'm just imagining three apostles know, or it's, two apostles. It's an interesting relationship. And this v- chief of police of Salt Lake yeah. literally breaking down the door of another Mormon apostle in Salt Lake City yeah. and catching them in the very act. Now, he um, Lyman later says that he, he writes to a, a, a relation and says that Vetterly told him that if Vetterly knew that it was Lyman they were after, he would never have gone along with it. All he was told was that it was a big fish. Yeah. 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 And so maybe that gets Vetterly out the hook a tiny bit, but it's still weird. Yeah. Well, the context for this, I think, is fascinating because it seems to me very clear that the way this comes to church leaders' attention is due to a Salt Lake bishop named Fred Curtis, who had been part of this widespread program under J. Reuben Clark's supervision of hunting out polygamists. And it was, they would go to meetings, they would take down license plate numbers, and then they would get to their contacts in the police or the DMV, have those run, come back to them, then they would go to their, those people's, their bishop, and have them disciplined. So it was part of a very widespread, coordinated surveillance effort. And I, Lyman, I think, was just an accidental uh, result of that, which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, there needs to be a book on like the churches, the Salt Lake City corporate churches relationship with law enforcement. I remember, I think I remember Brett Metcalf talking about like that when there was an ERA event happening in the 70s in Salt Lake City, I guess the church partnering with law enforcement to take down license plate numbers of, of women involved in the ERA stuff. And then there's the whole spiring at BYU in the 60s with Wilkinson, like that could be a book, probably the church's relationship with law enforcement yeah. In, in, yeah. in Salt Lake City in Utah. Kind of weird, right? Yeah. And probably not just law enforcement. Right. You know, probably. Oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess it's really important to mention that, you know, just like Carolyn Pearson has that lovely book, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, like polygamy is always a part. So Lyman, just like. You know, um, just like Carrington had his little folly justification, if there's no mm-hmm. seed mixed, no harm, no foul, 
Lyman had a justification too. Do you guys want to tell what Lyman's justification for the affair was? Well, uh, you mean like initially what they thought? They, they, they thought that they were, uh, so this is an interesting question. What did, did Lyman view the relationship as some kind of crypto plural marriage and, and that they were actually married in some way? Um, some people say it looks like maybe there was this kind of relationship. Maybe they had, maybe Lyman had, you know, married himself to her. Um, I don't know that I'm persuaded by that. I mean, early on, it does look like Lyman was viewing her as a potential eternal wife, uh, not in this life. And, and it also seems clear later on that he says this was not, that, that he did not view their relationship, the, his extramarital relationship with Anna Jacobson as a, some kind of crypto plural marriage. Brian, what, what do you think? It's a tough one. Mike Quinn was very convinced and he, he, Leonard Arrington asked him about it one time and he told Leonard flat out, this was a case of polygamy. I'm, I'm more along with, with you there. And then again, there's history to that, that the idea of the solemn covenant where it was just a mutual vow, there was no ceremony, there was no officiator. That's very kind of loosey goosey. And I think you, you could argue for that being that kind of relationship, but uh, yeah, I don't think it's it's persuasive enough. He he does if 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 Lyman ever believed that he didn't later. He you know part of his condition the conditions for him being readmitted into the church. What he he had to say that it was an extramarital relationship. It well, wasn't a plural marriage. Yeah. So in my mind, as I'm trying to reconstruct this, I you know the fact that he wanted to get rebaptized and get his blessings restored. You know, the fact that he was a Mormon apostle tells me he was a, a sincere believer in mm -hmm. the gospel. Mm -hmm. And and so in my mind, if he is uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he's having an extramarital relationship, he's got to manage his cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And for me, that is the way he's going to manage his cognitive dissonance, is by feeling like, I love you so much, God has to be okay with this, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now, let me give you a hug, like I'm feeling so good about this. So it must be that God has given us his okay, mm -hmm. and this and this is polygamy. I mean, I, to me, there's just no, no way that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that could be. I mean, yeah. it could be, and they continue, you know, after their excommunications, there was a period of time where they continued to see each other. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you do wonder what kind of gymnastics he went through, you know, to, to, to justify that. Well, one thing that blew me away that I had not learned about this story previously from this amazing book that I'm going to plug again, go buy it now, justice and mercy. <laughs> um, I am shilling for you guys. Come on. Um, no, no, no. Th this book is worthy. Uh, was how terrified the brethren were as soon as they excommunicated Richard Lyman for who they were worried he would connect up with. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you want to fill in the blanks there? The Brian, because Brian. this is his. <laughs> what was he terrified? What were they terrified? This, that? yeah. The, Carolyn Pearson's book, Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, this is just a case study of this, because when polygamy is just sort of left hanging that we don't do anymore, largely for, for legal reasons, because it was it was the government had come down on it, not that we no longer believe in it. Yeah. Um then that is always part of the equation. And by the 1940s, again, like I said, this I really do think Lyman comes to light out of this polygamous surveillance effort. They're, uh, of course, worried that he will go to become this sort of uh, kind of like his grandfather Amos Lyman became the figurehead for the new movement. That he comes and he's which, now... Which movement? Uh, the, the, the Godbeites. Yeah, and okay. so he he is the kind of the star catch of the movement. Um, you know, this former apostle. They're worried that the grandson Richard Lyman, same thing. He becomes now a prominent fundamentalist and former apostle. This is evidence that polygamy still is correct. Yeah. And so that is it. That is a, and and justifiably, I think, was a fear. So did did didn't the book say that some fund? So what we're talking about is what we've covered in previous episodes about the fundamentalist movement that happens in the early 20th century that by the mid 20th century is kind of really starting to form in, in the short Creek kind of Utah, Arizona, Colorado kind of area. Is that right? 
And as I understand it, does, doesn't someone come meet with Lyman? Don't some fundamentalists actually come meet with him? They really wanted him to join <laughs> with them. And, and that would have been just an amazing coup for them had that happened. But it, it does seem very clear that he had no interest in that at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, did they try to meet? Did did they actually meet? I thought I read. That I, th- they I did. thought there was a rumor that they. Yeah, I think they, they wanted met, to, but, but I, I don't if, think that they. They were actually okay. ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Well, that 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 was a fascinating twist that I, I want to find the reference because I marked it up. But that was a fascinating reference. How how terrified the church must have been. Yeah. That he would become a figurehead yeah. for the for the polygamous yeah. movement, yeah. but he still believed in it. Yeah, you know, as they all probably did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they decide to excommunicate him. Do you want to talk about the deliberations or the decision to excommunicate him? And the, I mean, part of this book is it it goes into detail in the disciplinary councils, mm-hmm. and through journal entries talks about Spencer W. Kimball's reaction to Lyman, Harold B. Lee's reaction, Joseph. You know, it it, it well they're they're all yeah. Uh, surprised uh, and they're devastated by this. Again, they thought that this was, uh, they, they felt betrayed it, by, like, by, by, by Lyman. It implies that Heber J. Grant died of heartbreak because of what happened to Richard yeah. Lyman yeah. over the grief yeah. that like Richard Lyman goes to see Heber J. Grant and Heber J. Grant. I, I mean, I want to say he's like lying on the floor yeah. and, and Heber J. Grant's just like, go away. I can't even stand to see you kind of yeah. thing. Like, like the grief, yeah. it, it, someone else, one of the apostles cries for like three days, it says. Like yeah. that's, why were they so torn up over Lyman? They weren't shedding tears over Carrington, it doesn't seem. Why, why, what about Lyman made well, them so Well, I think so they were genuinely shocked. So, so, so there was that, that, that initial uh, disclosure of, of what had been going on under their noses, that he had been so uh, uh, disloyal uh, to to the to, to to the feeling among the twelve of, of this uh, this you know the, the unanimity that they would have felt for each other. Uh, Ezra so Tapp Benson's that. yeah. Ezra Tapp Benson's my cousin, and it writes. I, I don't think of him as a particularly emotional man. Mm-hmm. Ezra Tapp Benson writes, "I could not hold back tears of sorrow for my brother who had committed this grievous sin." Yeah. That's Ezra Tapp Benson, yeah. and he's in Europe and is hearing this <laughs> by. Letter, right. cablegram, or something. Is he yeah. in Europe or is he yeah. in Washington D.C.? He's in. He might he's be in, in D.C. Europe. I think he's okay. in Europe. Yeah, oh, he? he's okay. he's can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So were... I think there was that. There was that initial shock. Yeah. Um. Uh, then you know Lyman tries to. <laughs> and by the way, it's in the it's in the front page of the Deseret News, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, notice of excommunication by George Albert Smith. Notice is hereby given that after due hearing before the Council of the Twelve Apostles and upon his own confession, Richard R. Lyman has been excommunicated from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for violation of the Christian law of chastity yeah. by the order of the Council of the Twelve Apostles, signed George Albert Smith. <laughs> well, and I think this also goes to um, the, the emphasis on sexual transgression that is is so shocking to people. You know, I've been... 30 odd years since John W. Taylor had had been excommunicated, the last person to be excommunicated. But that was that was a, you know a, a protracted thing and that wasn't quite so shocking. But this Mormon sexual transgression is just is is always so shocking. Yeah. And to them to think that he had been sitting next to them in quorum meetings for 25 years, and while this had been going on for a good portion of that time, yeah, it was just it shocked their sensibilities greatly. Yeah. Now Lyman was he was bothered by the fact that they publicized it. He didn't think that it was, he thought they had mishandled it. And, and the, the, he kind of resented that. He felt personally attacked. Uh, and that informed his approach over the next almost 20 years, right? For when he, he trying to get rebaptized. And before and we they talk did about- not like that. Yeah. They, they, they felt that he was, so I think that they learned something. They, they all learned things about each other during that process. <laughs> um, and, and, and so they, 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 his response, you, you know, hurt as much his chances of, of rebaptism as, as anything. Well, it just seemed like that you have some amazing accounts in here of him appearing before the 12 and just like almost yelling at them yeah. for having excommunicated yeah. him, blaming them. And yeah. And admitting that he was still having an ongoing affair. Yeah. With Anna Jacobson, yeah. 
Like, what a spectacle. Yeah. An excommunicated apostle getting audience with the Quorum of the Twelve and then yelling at them and lecturing them for having excommunicated him. I can't even imagine that happening. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it does tell you a lot about, about Lyman and I, about how he viewed himself. How did he get audience with them? I would just assume they'd cut him off forever after that. Uh, I, you know, I think that they kept trying. They they kept hoping and they kept doing it. I mean, they kept exp- uh, uh entertaining the idea both both from him as well as from other family members that he should be readmitted. And finally, uh, Lyman does express enough remorse and enough repentance that they they do agree to uh, rebaptize him. But again, the uh, restoration of his priesthood and, and temple blessings, that's 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 another level of forgiveness that uh, he never gets that while he's alive. But he does get it afterwards. <laughs> Apparently he does. And that's the irony, right? Is that who is it who restores his blessings? It's Joseph Fielding Smith, who is now the church president. It's like, and, and it's like one of the first things he did was, when he became prophet, right? Yeah. I wonder why. Like, according to the story, yeah. I wonder why. Yeah. Well, I think that there was a lot of, um, I think his family kept kept up the pressure to have that happen. And, and maybe they did. Maybe Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold B. Lee decided it was time. Well, there does seem to be a very clear distinction between the, that restoration while living and posthumous. Yeah. Because there are numerous occasions where that doesn't happen, but once they're dead, they kind of figure, well, we'll just do it, and this is the whole, we'll let the Lord sort it out Right. approach. Yeah. Let's talk about two women that, that are casualties of the story. The first is um, Amy Lyman. Yeah. So she's still, I mean, imagine not only front page, I mean, dear listeners oh, yeah. and viewers, imagine not only front page news of the Deseret News, Mormon apostle excommunicated for adulterous affair, but imagine if his wife were also General Relief Society president. Yeah. And there's a really sad moment in the book where a church leader shows up to Amy Lyman and kind of has a talk with her. Who wants to? Well, she, but I think... Uh, a couple of things is th- is that first um, David O. McKay walks with her back into the Relief Society offices, accompanying her, which is supposed to send the message that it she did not. This is not her fault. That we are backing her, but it becomes clear that she can't continue. And I think it's isn't it J. Reuben Clark who has the talk with her Brian's and, and suggests that maybe it's time for a change in leadership. And I'm just like, why should she be punished for what her husband does? I don't does? think they saw it as punishment. No? I think she was having a really hard time being the president, not feeling responsible. Now she feels like she's not an example. Uh, and I think that she thought that it would be, in, maybe she thought it would be in her best interest to take some time away, uh, but also in the churches and in the Relief Society's best interest too. Yeah. But that's sad, right? Do you have any, any yeah. thoughts? Comments about Amy, Brian? Well, she's such a fascinating figure. She her biography, Faded Legacy by Dave Hall, is fantastic. Oh. And um adds adds some color to their their marriage that I think you drew on that was very helpful. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she she's just so interesting because she is very much a progressive woman. You know, she goes to Hull House while he's in college and she's she's around Jane Addams. And so the social programs of the Relief Society were very near and dear to her heart. She was very well liked by by the church membership, and so that was yeah that just added to not only was she Relief Society president but but very well loved, and to have that shock she had no idea that this was coming from everything that we can tell, mm-hmm. and and so to be confronted with that, um, just yeah devastating and yes a very very sad ending to her her time as as general president. And you've got something in the footnotes about one of the brethren kind of almost using Amy Lyman as, as an example of what happens when the woman works outside the home. It's like, mm-hmm. look, see, women should stay home barefoot and pregnant yeah. because if they work outside the home, you're going to end up like Amy Lyman. Yeah. What a tragic. And she must have heard that kind moral of Moral tale, too, cautionary yeah. tale, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just sad that she became a casualty. She does end up supporting him. Mm-hmm. They and sticks married. with him, yeah. even though he continues with, in his affair with Anna, yeah. Yeah. Amy Lyman still supports yeah. him. Well, they can't really divorce. So <laughs> it just wasn't. Stand by your man, it's John. A, yeah. 
Well, I mean, that, that can be okay. And that, that can be fine and that can be inspiring or sad, but yeah, yeah. It just, it's, it's clear she had a rough, yeah. she had a rough go yeah. and in, in some ways was a casualty. The other casualty is Anna Jacobson yeah. who was excommunicated for a second time. Yeah. That, that sucks. Let's talk about yeah. that. I don't see that's interesting. I don't know very much about that. She's, she's, she's a really hard person to track down. Um, she, she doesn't marry. Um, and she, ba- I think that she just continues to live in that center street apartment until she dies. Um, but she was excommunicated. Uh, Lyman was excommunicated, I think in November of 43 and she was excommunicated in January or February of 44. And again, and she was excommunicated by the 12. So that's an interesting, that point. was weird. That was interesting. Like yeah. why isn't it her own local yeah, bishop? I don't know. It may, maybe they <laughs> wanted to keep it under wraps and try to control the information. I think, but, again, this is, this is fallout from post-Second Manifesto stuff. The same thing would happen there. Um, they frequently, especially if it were better-known cases, would be would be handled by the 12 as opposed to local leadership. Hmm. So that I think that's just a continuation of that. Hmm. And I just have to call it, I think it was J. Reuben Clark who was shaming yeah. Amy, yeah. Um, Amy Lyman for working outside the home. Uh, do we like that guy? Do we like J. Reuben Clark? What's the consensus? They're all complicated people, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, it's like, for, for me, it's like these, each of these four men, you know, do I, what, what's my, how do I feel about them? And there are things I like and things I don't like. And yeah. I wish, I wish we're were, all, I wish, yeah. We're all fraught. What about you, Brian? Are you a J. Reuben Clark my, fan? Uh, Clark is tough. Um, <laughs> Mike Quinn's Attorney, biography. right? Such a fascinating book. Very, very well done. Very complicated man. Yeah, this, this, very accomplished government official, uh, attorney, um, but also very much a, a, a racist and a, a bigot at times. And he's yeah, he's a very he's a he's a very difficult person to really feel warm and fuzzy about. I think. <laughs> yeah. With John, with with these men that that you just read about in in this book. Are you about to ask me a question? I, is that okay? Are you allowed to ask gonna, me a question? I don't know, am I? I so, it's what, it's what never happened before. Feeling? What was I mean, your feeling about them? Are there are there did you like dislike what was, how did you respond to these to these men's experiences? To the three that we've talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Why are you asking me? This is Mormon stories. I ask you questions. <laughs> um well, uh, Carrington, he felt like a predator. Yeah. Um, kind of shameless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not crazy about that. Yeah. And Thomas Taylor felt like a pedophile. Yeah. So that's disgusting yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, w- with Richard Lyman, um, yeah, I, you know, I think I could, I could, I can't emotionally, I've never been able to understand pedophilia or child abuse. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's something that my brain can't wrap itself around. And, and Carrington's flagrant justification and grooming of, of multiple people Mm -hmm. as a high level leader of the church. Part of it is just the differential of power. Right. The, when you're at that level of significance Mm -hmm. and you're predatory on multiple women and justifying it and then lying about it. Mm -hmm. That's why for me, Albert Carrington, it's hard to have sympathy for Albert Carrington or Thomas Taylor. Yeah. Um, With Richard Lyman, there's never an excuse for, um, for, um, you know, cheating on a spouse. Mm -hmm. It's never good. You should never do it. It should never be done. And there's no justification for it. Um, So I'm never gonna justify that and I'm not gonna justify Richard Lyman. But I could, but but I could at least, in my mind, I can go. Okay, his wife's busy all the time. He's busy all the time. He's put in this. He's in this position of power, and then he's in this position that he should have never been put in, where he's asking asked to fellowship a woman who's single mm-hmm. over multiple years, and he has no sexual relationship with his wife, and the church has these high moral standards. That just seems like, um, and then there's the polygamy justification that's in the back of his mind. I see how that happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. And so, um, 
And then I, his denial afterwards and still doing it and yelling at the brethren, that all that self-justification, I can see in my old brain how, how that sort of thing could happen. So I think of the three, for me, Lyman approaches sympathetic, yeah. not yeah. to ever excuse his behavior. Right, right. Well, yeah. How, yeah. Brian, what do you think? Same thing. Yeah. Uh, and Lyman is an interesting case because he was he was I seemed to be very well loved by church members. He had kind of this gregarious personality, and he he seemed to strike a more moderate tone in his sermons. You know, there's examples that he was a little more understanding of human nature maybe than some of his colleagues were. Uh, you know, if you compare like like a Joseph Fielding Smith personality and Richard Lyman, I, I you know I you could people gravitated more toward him. Yeah. And I think that probably played into his colleagues shock and sense of betrayal also because they did love him. He was kind of this big bear of a man that they all liked. He was probably charismatic. Yeah, I think he definitely had more personal yeah. charisma than some of the others. And so when that happened, it was more of a betrayal and shock because they just they genuinely liked him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I just think I just think this tradition of well power power differentials are important and you know, um Bosses shouldn't shouldn't get involved with coworkers. I think that's wrong, and I'm you know um, I just think that is wrong, uh, especially if there's a power differential. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but this idea of like it 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 goes to eleven as they say in the Spinal Tap movie. If these men are supposed to be special witnesses of Christ, they're supposed to have special power. And that's why I'm particularly sad about Anna Jacobson. Like if ever there was a, yeah. a reason to not excommunicate an yep. adulteress, let's call yep. her that, even though it's a yep. crappy word, yep. when you've got an apostle who from her perspective is grooming you yeah. and has all this power differential. Yeah. And then if the, he's in touch with Christ and God and he in the, and the polygamy thing is still in DNC 132. And if he's talking in any way, I feel the spirit that we're meant to be together then she's a flat out victim right. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. He deserved to be excommunicated. She deserved to be loved and yeah. supported. Yeah. So yeah. I think she's, yeah. and then how can she, if she stays in Salt Lake for the rest of her life, yeah. how is she supposed to go out? Yeah. Yeah. Ever. So the 12 was not united on excommunicating her. That, that was an interesting thing to, to find out. Um, and I think that George Albert Smith goes on the record and, and says, I was not in favor of this action. Yeah. That, that just doesn't seem right. The dynamics of the of the quorum, I think, in all these cases is fascinating to see how they individually think about it. And you can see the hardliner personalities stand yeah. out and those that are more willing and those that are just kind of more willing to go along with whatever is the decision, too. Yeah. And that's I think will be interesting to readers is to see how those dynamics work at these very high pressure, high stakes kind of cases. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings us to Joseph F. Smith. The the gay church patriarch. <laughs> he was the he was the pres, yeah he was the presiding patriarch. Uh, he was so so this is Joseph F. Smith, either the second or the third, uh, depending on what you're talking about. He was the his grandfather was Joseph F. Smith, the LDS Church president. His father was Hiram Smith. Is that right? George uh, Joseph F. Smith's oldest son, who died as a young man. He was an apostle and he died as uh, I think from. The flu, uh, the influenza, uh, and so Joseph F., the, the second or third, because his uncle was Joseph Fielding Smith. So there's a lot of Joseph F. Smiths, there's a lot of Joseph Fielding Smiths in that family. Anyway, he was a, a professor of speech um, who at a certain point was uh, named to be the presiding patriarch. And he was named to, presiding, to be the presiding patriarch after like a 10-year period when there wasn't a presiding patriarch because Heber J. Grant didn't want to name... Elder G. Smith is the presiding patriarch, and so they had acting patriarchs until finally Heber J. Grant was able to convince the Twelve that, no, we need to get one. It should not be this Smith. It should be this other Smith. And so Joseph F. Joseph F. Smith was named the presiding patriarch uh, to the church. Um, it's interesting that he, he seems a little bit progressive. Like on yeah. eight, page 86, he's quoted as saying, honest doubt was never shameful, Honest doubt is a solitary thing. Dynamic doubt is a good thing. A lazy doubt is a bad thing. As a lazy anything is bad. Yeah. So well, he, like a he, pro doubt. He he had been patriarch? a teacher, yeah, a professor uh, of speech at the University of Utah. So he would have interacted with 
with a lot of, um, you know, young adults and, and, uh, he was a, a master thespian. He, he, <laughs> he, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was a patriarch, uh, for about four years, three or four years, gave about 1700 patriarchal blessings. Then something happened. And, and just really quickly, that position, I, I didn't realize this till reading the chapter. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was supposed to give patriarchal blessings to all the people who didn't, didn't have a patriarch. Yeah, Is that right? right. Uh -huh. And then maybe special ones. Uh, yeah, you could, you could, you could request sometimes, uh, a, a specific blessing from, from the presiding patriarch. Yeah. 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 Like as soon as he got called in, he wanted to give one of the apostles a, a blessing. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So he so, so the, of, of, of all of the four cases for me, um, his was the hardest just because the sources were incomplete. Mm. Um, and so I don't know exactly what happened. I don't, what, something happened in 44, 45. And then it comes to light in 46. And so there's a, there's a, 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 a man goes to meet with one or more of the general authorities and complains that something had happened between Joseph F. Smith and his son. Um, it's possible it may have come out as he was preparing for a mission. Quinn hypothesizes. It's, it's we just, just don't quite. And we don't know exactly what happened either. Something happened between Joseph F. Smith and this man's son. And it was serious enough that they decided they needed to, to the, the general authorities needed to look into this. Um, I think that it's George Albert Smith, right? Who meets, who asks to meet with, Meets with his father one time, and then... Uh, and it might be more, though. But who's the church president? He, he, George, George Albert Smith mm -hmm. is. So his counselors are David O. McKay and Clark. J. Reuben Clark. Mm -hmm. um, whatever happened, Joseph F. Smith downplays it or denies it. But that's not enough. This continues to... The, 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 the boy's father continues to, to complain about this, Finally, there's a, a meeting and Joseph F. Smith, something happens. Joseph F. Smith admits or confesses to something. And at that point then, he is, he is told not to come back to the church office building. Uh, his secretary is told that there won't be any more patriarchal blessings. And, and Joseph F. Smith goes into seclusion, into his home. I think he lived in North Salt Lake or Bountiful, up around there, Centerville. Um, but something is going on. And, and they just don't know what, what's happening. Then uh, this happens during a summer, the early part of a summer. Later in that summer, there is a meeting. He is brought in to the 12. He says something. He confesses something. Is that the meeting it's where something the boy and shocking. his father, I think, are both there? Is that there? right? I They're think there so. Too? And, 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 and he admits that something happened between himself and the, the, the young man. Um, but exactly what it is, I don't know, but it's serious enough. Uh, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith in his diary writes that it was disgusting. He doesn't want to talk about it. It's too disgusting to talk about. Mm. Uh, something like that. Uh, things. Joseph uh, F. Smith, is, is, um, he goes into a deep depression during this time. And, and there are other kinds of symptoms that show up. Um, and, and he... He's willing to continue as the presiding patriarch, but it's clear that that um, George Albert Smith and David O. McKay and others feel like he just can't do it. This is not appropriate. Um, and so they he submits a letter that says that you can do what you want to with me. He is then at the October's conference, he is released for what they say is an unspecified condition. Hmm. And... After that, uh, I guess there are enough rumors circulating that it was some kind of, of a homosexual uh, encounter that happened between him and this, this, this young man. Um, he, the, the family's devastated. I don't know how much his wife knows. I, she must know the general particulars of, of what happened or or at least guessed. Um, they relocate to Hawaii. 
Uh, he, uh, the the church there in Hawaii, is told not to extend any offers to him, not to not to call him to anything, anything nothing like that. Uh, he gets a job teaching uh, at the University of Hawaii. Uh, his wife later uh, teaches elementary school, I think. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, Elder G. Smith is is then called to replace him as the presiding patriarch. Uh, 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 Heber J. Grant has died by this time, so it's George Albert Smith who calls him, who calls Elder G. Smith to be the presiding patriarch. The, I, I did make a note in the chapter that this idea of any blood lineage, oh yeah, sort of like associations. They didn't. To, they they, to they didn't leadership. like it either. They, no, nobody else in the in the hierarchy it, it, really liked it. Why don't you explain what what the blood lineage thing was? Well, the the idea, right, Brian, was that the presiding patriarch had to descend from. Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith's brother. Is that right? Or any of the Smiths, right? Well, it got interpreted that way, that, that it could maybe extend out beyond. And that was, uh, I think, that wasn't that Heber J. Grant's complaint? Well, he really wanted his son-in-law to be yeah. the presiding patriarch. And they had that, that this whole standoff, they're, they're interpreting this idea various ways. That's on its own, is a fascinating story. Yeah. yeah, but they don't like it. They, they, they see that it's problematic. It ties their hands as to who they can call into the hierarchy. Uh, and Joseph F. Smith, especially, he kind of elevated the presiding patriarch uh, to a position between uh, basically the first presidency and the 12. And the 12 didn't like that either. So later on, in when is it, 78, 80, something like that? 78. 78, yeah. uh, they, they were, basically they retired the office. They release Elder G. Smith without ever appointing uh, uh, a successor to him. Can you just do that? Can you, Joseph set something up and it becomes inconvenient? It's it's awkward. You got a gay patriarch. You got this bloodline thing that's super no. weird, and you don't like announce it. You don't like say, "Hey, everyone, we're canceling this." Sorry, it was revelation then, but it's we're we're just gonna quietly mothball this. Like yeah. that's isn't that a weird? Pr- it's kind of like calling Leonard Arrington as church historian at general conference. And then when you release him and shut down the department, you don't mention it. It's, yeah, it is I mean, it's, it is interesting, isn't it? How? It's, it's normal corporate PR, yeah. but it's not the type of accountability I would expect from yeah. the way the church taught me honesty works. What do yeah. you guys think? Yeah. I think that's an interesting, so I, I don't know if they actually thought that they were going to never again call a presiding patriarch, but I do think they had, they, they saw that in practice, it was a difficult calling to maintain, especially when uh, your hands are tied as to whom you could call to this particular position. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, once you designate Eldred as emeritus status, the that inertia of that emeritus status just stays. And at that point, any subsequent leader, I think, would be it would be too. It would require too much to reactivate it. So by by just simply designating him as emeritus, you had effectively done away with it. Yeah. And it, it was such a, a a long, fraught, complicated history that I think pretty much all of them were agreed it's just easier to not have this position. It was never clear what it meant. Yeah, you have periods like Joseph F. Smith where it's a little higher status, and then other times it's lower, and it was it was just too complicated. It was easier to just not have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Joseph F. Smith, his family are in Hawaii. Uh, gradually, uh, the, the the Joseph F. Smith and family members start making, and, and also his his local leaders too, start inquiring uh, at church headquarters. Can't we call this person? Uh, I don't even know if the local leaders know fully exactly what happened, but they're they're just told don't extend any callings to him. Uh, after a s- period of time, maybe 15 years, 20 years, he they do. They call him to Joseph F. Smith to serve in the High Council in Hawaii. And it's it's there he where and so so there was never any official action taken against him. He was never uh, excommunicated. He was never formally disfellowshipped. He was his priesthood was never taken, his temple blessings were stayed intact. So there wasn't anything to restore. They, 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 all they did, all the church headquarters did was to finally say, okay, you can go ahead and call him if you want to, if you feel like you can serve. So and, there's, there's kind of, it's a, it, there's consensus that he had a homosexual relationship, but maybe because it wasn't well known enough 
and the church wanted to avoid scandal, plus he had high connections. He's given a pass. Well, I also think that they, uh, I don't know if they viewed it as a homosexual relationship or if they viewed it as some kind of inappropriate physical, same-sex physical uh, activity that that was not consensual. So, See, and that's the other thing, too. I don't know exactly what oh. happened between, oh. between Joseph F. Smith and this young man. Um, there are stories, Connell O'Donovan, who is, you know, the expert on LGBTQ Mormon and Utah history, uh, has talked about, uh, possible, possible earlier relationships that Joseph F. Smith may have been involved in before he was called as, as the presiding patriarch. So there, there may be a history of Joseph F. Smith. Um, he stayed married. Um, do we get the sense that he may have had other relations, gay relationships in Hawaii while he was living there? Do we even have any info I, on I that? I think that Connell talked to somebody who who alluded to something. Yeah. But again, I just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. He was kind of exiled, right? Is that fair yeah, to say? Well, it was kind of a self-exile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He, he, you know, he didn't want to hang around here and be the <laughs> subject of gossip and stuff. So, and yeah. he had served his mission initially was in Hawaii. Okay. So he did have a connection to Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. And then he died, I guess in 64, something like that. He passed away. His son was on a mission at that point. And, um, uh, Mark Peterson, uh, counseled him not to, to come home for the mission, which was, I guess, pretty standard policy for, for missionaries not to come back home. Cause th- I think they worried they wouldn't go back. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's Joseph F. Smith. Yeah. And just to, to kind of, um, you know, to kind of round out, I, I've had church discipline things happen in my, let's just say extended family. And, um, yeah. And, and I've, I've made mistakes in my life. So, you know, I feel mixed about all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I've been excommunicated by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and there are things I've had to repent to my Bishop to about, so this, this brings up a lot of feelings for me, but, you know, disciplinary councils are in many cases barbaric. Um, the church and its publicity of things is, you know, but, but, but for me, the biggest thing is just the power differential. No, no, no person should ever claim special access to the divine. That's too much power. So when you add that to these church leaders in positions of influence, um, you know, this is heartbreaking, tragic, mm-hmm. uncomfortable stuff. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. but, but then, yeah, seeing the back behind the scenes machinations is fascinating, which is why I think this book, yeah. everyone's going to love this book. So we talked about the the four main chapters. Yeah. Brian, do you want to just talk about the, what comes what's, after what's in the rest of the book? Because that's just half the book. That's just half the These book. These four yeah. stories is just half the yeah. book. So what else is in the book, Brian? It's like a, it's like a good Mike Quinn book. If you're skipping the, if you're just reading the text, you're not reading the rest of it, you're missing some of it. So we have um, some statistical things that Gary put together looking at specific periods of excommunication and some data analysis there that's very interesting. Um, Levinas' contribution, absolutely fantastic. It started as a Sunstone presentation. She had some more current data on excommunication from the uh, from the mid-1960s through 1970s. And so it's part data analysis, but it's also traditional Levina musings. On, you know, she's one of our many consciences of, what does this mean? What is excommunication? Do we need excommunication? What's the effects of it? Um, another important part of her essay is uh, she looks at how the criteria for dealing with excommunication evolved over that period that she looked at in the handbooks, which is also very interesting. Um, we have some very fascinating excerpts from the Salt Lake Stake in the 1880s up through the 1890s as the manifesto happens, and looking at these very interesting cases of plural marriage and how those were handled. Um, and then Gary had compiled all these public notices of excommunication, like you mentioned, they would be announced in wards, but they would also be published. So uh, the Deseret News, the church news section, would publish, sometimes with the reasons for it. And then in footnotes, we look at uh, more of the story. And they range anywhere from one guy didn't want his home teachers to come in, <laughs> which was I'm probably more to the story, but that was the specific reason given, to, like you mentioned, as the, the fundamentalist groups start to coalesce through the 30s and 40s, we see all sorts of recognizable names there. Um, we see Rulin Jeff show up. We see Rulin Allred show up. And so uh, the LeBarons 
And so these recognizable names from fundamentalist history uh, that become part of the story. So lots of good stuff. Uh, I think readers, readers will will love the book. Yeah. So just reading kind of Appendix 4 is Excommunications and Disfellowshipments, an Alphabetical Register of Names and Related Data, 1930 to 1953. Fawn Brody's name shows up there as well. Fawn Brody's in there, yeah. Um, and then Appendix 5 is a Decade of Excommunications, a 1965 to 1975 profile because yep. I'm like, where's my name? And then I'm like, oh, I didn't make the I didn't make the window. Um, what what ha what I haven't read the Hunsaker versus Hunsaker appendix. Oh, I What's that? About that? What one. is that? Oh, that is a that is a fascinating story. So this is the extended Hunsaker family up in Honeyville, and the the father Abraham Hunsaker had been sort of one of the pillars of the community. He passes away, leaving I think five wives and all these these. Um, half siblings from the different wives that are all sort of related in business things, and some are guardians and, and that thing. Um, at the time, Rudger Clausen, who will later become an apostle and president of the Quorum of the Twelve, is the stake president. And he writes an incredibly detailed account of this in his journal, the whole thing. So rumors start to get out that one of these brothers has, is accused of some homosexual behavior with some of the other brothers. And it comes to the bishop's court, and they talk about it there, and decisions <clears throat> are made, but then they get appealed to the stake president, and the stake president reverses it, and the bishop isn't necessarily willing to go along with him, and the word is divided on it. And so for in two separate occasions, the sacrament is removed from the ward for a period of several months. Just a fascinating thing that I don't... Because it's family against family, yes. basically. You know, and it's playing out in very public ways... And again, thanks to these these fantastic primary sources that, that Gary came up with, we have this very detailed picture of how this very complicated, very controversial case played out in church, in the city, um, and eventually is appealed to the first presidency, and the, the bishop, who is not willing to play ball, gets removed. And there's an acting bishop for a time. And then apostles are sent to the ward to try to, to settle things, and they take a vote. And apparently, most people vote for the old bishop. But that's you can't do that. That's not how it's supposed to play out. And so it's just this mm. very interesting, complicated case yeah. of family versus family. Yeah. Well, what a brilliant book, uh, Gary Bergera, Levina Feeling Anderson, and Brian Buchanan. But before we go, again, it's Justice and Mercy studies of transgression in the Latter-day Saint community. Please buy it now. Please reward good scholarship. I have to ask you this. Why didn't you publish this with Signature Books? Is that a sensitive question? Well, uh, it's not a sensitive question it, uh, uh, because this was Brian's idea. He's the, he's the one who came to me and said, what if I or we do, uh, you know, we gather these essays together and then maybe supplement with any other material that might be available. And I said, okay, that's great. It's, the less work I have to do on this, the better. So, mm. so it was Brian's idea. Why, what does that have to do with it being published as signature or not? <laughs> so, so, so not well, because it was, it didn't, if, if, if now, if Brian had said, why don't, why don't I do that? Why don't I, Brian do this for signature? Then it would go through the regular process. And okay. to be honest, because of my connection to signature, I worry about stuff that I do, uh, that, conflict that, that of interest stuff. Or? Conflict of interest, but also, you know, the, the whole idea of a vanity press, you know, that just exists to publish mm. stuff that, you know, the, the, that we employees might be involved with. So I, I'm not, I'm not eager to try to, to, to encourage that kind of a, of a view, but it really was Brian's and Brian had Brian. What, so Brian has published other books. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, they've all been up to this point, right? Reprints, reprints, of, of stuff, yeah. public domain kinds of materials mm -hmm. yeah. that uh, mostly 19th century, yeah, LDS kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. So this is the first uh, non-reprint. Well, it still is a half reprint, a hybrid that 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 Brian's done. And so I'm hoping that Brian continues to you know publish stuff. Me too, Brian. Me too. You're a you're a not a hidden gem, but you're a gem in. I, I <laughs> you're super smart, knowledgeable. So, yeah, I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Me too. Me, Me too, too, Gary. Me too. Well, You're I'm, no slouch, Gary. This was a <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. I'll, I'll see if I can change that in the future. Have you, remind me if you've published any other books. So the first one was, and again, it was kind of a, a, a hybrid, was Conflict in the Quorum. 
Oh, yeah. It was that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it was a the classic. book that Ron and I did on BYU. Uh, conflict in the Quorum is about what? So Conflict in the Quorum is about the uh, sometimes contentious relationship between Orson Pratt, uh, Joseph Smith, and especially Brigham Young. Okay. Over polygamy with Joseph Smith and over doctrine with Brigham Young. That's an important book. Uh, it was fun to work on, so... Okay, other books of note? Uh, the last, the big thing, was the edited diaries of uh, Leonard Arrington. Ooh. So there was that, the, the three yeah. volumes of the Leonard Arrington diaries. That's, 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 bef- that's, this is the, Brian's is the most recent, but the one before that was, was that, the Leonard Arrington diaries. That come after Greg's Leonard Arrington book? It did come out yeah. after, yeah. Yeah, I would love to yeah. have your, I think we talked about maybe doing an episode about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Gary, thank you for this book, but also thank you for all your contribution contributions over the past several decades. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just going to say my secular prayers every night until you and, or Ron (laughs) Prittis and, or George Smith Uh agree to come on more stories and tell your stories. Okay. You're going to think about it. I promise you, I will think about it. Can we get a commitment that I will think about it? Sure. No, that you'll do it. Uh, how Not about yet. if I just think about it? Okay. Uh, so, but yeah, yeah, this is, this has been really enjoyable, John. So thank you again for the, for the invitation. Okay. All right. And you'll be stepping down from the Smith Pettit Foundation. At the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Then that's it. That's it. Yep. You're done. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and thanks for everything you've done for us. Sure. Thank you. And Brian, keep on going with the uh, Mormon history podcast also, check out Benchmark Books. Do you want to tell them what Benchmark Books is? Sure. And how they can uh, how they can get cool books and also support a worthy institution? Sure. So we're in South Salt Lake, not too far from here. Uh, we do new books. We do more kind of the academic end of the spectrum. So a lot of stuff the Signature publishes, University Presses. Um, but then we also do, do used, used and rare books. So And that can range from anything from your favorite Anita Stansfield novel to a first edition of the Book of Mormon. So we've seen some some absolutely amazing things come through our door. You do have a first edition. Uh, we don't right now, but oh, we okay. recently had three at the same time. So that was fun. So you, you sell rare books at Benchmark Books. We do. In addition to new books. We've got some treasures. We get some fun artifacts. We've had pieces of the original Nauvoo Temple. Um, right now we have a vintage sacrament service set. And uh, it was... We think not too long after the individual sacrament cups were introduced, and then probably a 19th century bread tray. So hmm. uh, we can play some pretty good show and tell down there. What do, what do those? So, what are they listed for? Uh, we've got that set right now at five thousand. Okay. So and what does the first edition Book of Mormon run for these? First days? edition Book of Mormon um, is probably in the hundred thousand dollar range. Um, it depends if it's uh, a notable copy, if it belonged to someone interesting, if it's in really nice shape. It might be a little more than that. If it's got problems, it might be less than that. But um, So, yeah, we, we serve everyone from the, the casual reader to the very interested reader to the collector. And uh, we've, we've, we have fun stuff. We also do author events. Todd Compton was at the store last night to talk about his new book. So we, uh, we get to play a very fun role in, in seeing Mormon history and Mormon studies develop. What is the most valuable book in existence related to Mormon studies that, that one could buy? Book of Commandments, hands down. The yeah, original 18, yep. what, 1833? Is, is what that is also it? the rarest? By far, yeah. There's about 30 copies known, and only maybe half a dozen of those are in private hands. And so anytime one of those changes hands, that's that's a big deal. That's 1833? 1833, yeah. And, and what does one of those run for these days? Probably at least a million dollars. Okay. That's, All right. Who's got, who's got one? Got some value. The uh, church, I guess. Gary actually has three of them. I don't what know. What the... the Sure, I've got three of them. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. That level of collecting is is a little different different yeah. atmosphere. Okay, so. who has Are, the most? Does the LDS Church have the most? You would think. I think so. Yeah. yeah. In fact, there is a um, Rick Turley and Bill Slaughter did a book about the development of the Doctrine and Covenants, and they have this fascinating photo of about five or six different copies that they own. Because if you remember the story, they were never formally published because they were interrupted. And so each copy is in many ways unique. They would just take them and have them bound. So there's one that's, you know, just kind of a plain leather binding, one that's kind of stitched leather binding. And there's mm. fascinating artifacts Very of cool. our history. Very cool. So, yeah. 
All right. Well, the book is Justice and Mercy. Buy it. Studies of Transgression in the Latter-day Saint Community. The the man is Gary Bergera. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Um, and uh, also, thank you, Brian. Thanks, Keep up John. the good work. Thank you. All right. And uh, thanks for your support of Mormon Stories Podcast. Hope you enjoyed today. And please help me harass Gary until he comes back on. And help me harass Brian to come back on Mormon Stories again by your compliments. So please shower them with praise for their appearances today <laughs> so that they'll be incentivized to come back another time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much.